not John Nelson Gammon, <laughs> is Robert Mays. Robert Mays is a professor of practice in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Texas State University and Executive Director and Chief Water Policy Officer at the Middle Center for Water and Environment. He is here today to talk about how bad has the current drought been, reports from the field on water resources. All yours, Robert. Thank you, Jose. Um, so uh, kind of looking through the attendees, we've got a, a really um, astute group of folks there. I think I saw Mark Wenzel out there and Paul Bertetti. Um, what what I'm going to show you all is, is you know, what I'm aware of uh, as far as water resource impacts. And then I think like many of us, you know, also kind of have some frontline um, experience with it. Like right now I'm looking out at San Marcos Springs and, you know, we've been definitely affected by this this drought. So I'm just going to share some some observations and, and reports and uh, some interesting things that are, you know, kind of going around the state. Um, this is the um, Palmer Drought Severity Index, um, kind of the historical one goes from 1895 up until uh, current. And so you can see in orange um, where there's droughts and then in green where we're not in droughts, uh, we're in wet periods. Um, you see in kind of in the center left, the 1950s drought, that big hunk of orange. Um, then off to the right, you can see the kind of September 2011, 2011, you know, the worst one year drought of record. And also you see the breadth of that, and then you can see kind of a more recent one. And on a statewide basis, you know, apart from a, a little interlude there, that little spike of green, you know, we've been in something of a drought that that rivals 2011, um, but but not quite. Um, and I think, as you all know, each drought is different and it affects the state differently. Um, this is a bit of a, there's a lot of information here, but but really the purpose is to show for the different climatic regions, um, that orange stuff and how it's a little different as you go across the state. I'm not gonna talk about each of these um, as opposed to the previous plot, which started in 1895. This one goes from uh, a beginning of 2000 up to current. And um, one thing that's kind of interesting to me is like looking at, um, Region five here, um, you know, they've mo but mostly been in drought. And then, I mean, pretty much been in drought, um, you know, arguably since September 6th. There's been some good little, a few little glimpses of good spells, but, you know, it's been, been pretty bad. Um, also, if you look at six, this is also um, a longer period of droughts on the Edwards plateau and then taking a look at nine um, again just mostly drought particularly since uh, gosh 2011 um, you know that south central Texas has mostly been in drought um, and then we can kind of take a look at at seven here um, where you know for that that region which includes part of central Texas you know it's it's a at least in terms of length, it's a drought that's actually even looks like it's maybe even longer than the um, 2015 droughts. Well, no, I'm sorry, it's not because here's the 2015 drought. Um, but it's, you know, it gives you a sense that, that, that things are different depending where you're at in the state. Uh, as far as a uh, statewide reservoir capacity, um, so this is going from, um, gosh, late 30s up to present. The black line is showing conservation storage, um, uh, total conservation storage. So every time it goes up, it's like a new reservoir is coming online or a reservoir has been expanded. Um, and then the blue, um, and sometimes this is kind of estimated with the with the orange is showing, you know, where we're at, how much our reservoirs are full across the state. And so you can see that um, 2011, 2015 drought here, and then 
situation we're in right now. Yeah, you know, we've not ex um, exceeded the low point of storage we saw in the 2011 drought. Um, and then, you know, things looked a lot worse during that 2011 to 2015 drought as compared to here. Again, statewide basis. Um, but again, drought expresses itself differently on a local level. This is showing um, reservoir storage um, for 20, uh, 2023 here in this dark line. And we did get a bump um, towards the end of, of October when that system came through. Um, it's also showing the median statewide storage, uh, the max and the min with those being defined from 1990 to 2022. Um, and then the, the Water Development Board helpfully put 2011 down, um, kind of added this during this current drought to put things into perspective. Um, and so, you know, again, I guess we started the year off in worse shape in 2011 and are ending the year in, in better shape, but we're still, you know, more than 10 percentage points down. Um, again, story changes um, when you start looking at the details. So with this, this current drought, which you know, I would say we, you know, we've been in, in the last two to three years, um, you know, we've, we've seen record low um, levels in, in Lake Amistad, you know, record low since inundation. So you know, obviously the lake started off zero, so it's a little, you don't want to compare to that. You kind of want to compare from this full point going forward. Um, and then we've been, you know, we've been pretty low since 2012, 2013 in Lake Amistad. Um, we did get, uh, we kind of had that mellow remnants of a tropical system kind of run up the Rio Grande Valley that provided some needed relief, um, but we're, you know, heading back, back down again. Um, that's, that's caused some interesting issues. Um, you know, Laredo was, you know, looking at, you um, having some serious water supply issues within like six to 12 months um, because of those low levels in Lake Amistad. Um, this news article, there's a quote, um, which is true. If you look at the water plan, Laredo should not have any water problems till 2040. They don't have any strategies that show up in the state water plan in 2040. But uh, you know, as quote, we had this 2040 timeline in our heads. Then with this year's drought, things just get out of control so quickly. Um, and so just a reminder that, um, you know, we, we plan, um, we plan for the drought of record. Um, we make a lot of assumptions about things, but things can go to hell pretty quick. Um, and water suppliers, in my opinion, really need to be thinking about that. Um, and even setting aside climate change, you know, you look at tree ring data, you know, we've had far worse droughts. Um, and even with the 2011, 2015 drought, we've seen droughts worse than the drought of record, and perhaps this current drought might show up as a new drought of record in some parts of the state, um, but that needs additional uh, analysis. Um, Canyon Lake has seen the lowest level since inundation. Um, I put here, you know, it's clearly drought is part of this, but then there's also increased use, which complicates things. So just because we've seen the lowest levels we've ever seen in Canyon Lake doesn't necessarily mean that this is a new drought of record. With the you know, exploding population growth and increased use, you know that could be the case. Um, I had taken a look for a reporter in the past on you know inflows, zero inflows coming into Canyon Lake, and you know we've seen I think the most days with zero inflows at Canyon Lake um, since the drought of the 50s, and the drought of the 50s is still substantially worse in terms of low inflows or zero inflows to Canyon Lake. So again, um, you wanna be, be careful because things get complicated with this increased use of the water. Um, those lows, low flows or those low levels in Canyon Lake, of course, had some consequences. Um, um, here's my San Antonio talking about you know, record lowest levels. Um, Blanco was uh, was struggling. They seem to be they seem to have like a dark cloud that does not rain hanging above them on water supplies. Um, you know, with their local supplies. You know, with with a past serious drought. You know, they've tapped into Canyon Lake with uh, independent supplier, but then their intake structure wasn't deep enough because um, you know folks will try to save money by maybe putting putting their intake structure here rather than at the very bottom 
Um, and you kind of look at the past, you're like, oh yeah, we just need to stick it maybe right here. And then boom, the lake hits a new historic low. So um, again, that can cause, cause some problems, but not everybody can afford like Las Vegas to bore a tunnel and put the literal bathtub drain in the bottom of a reservoir. Um, Waco Lake saw the lowest um, percent full on record. And you can see this is actually lower storage back here in the, the 80s and uh, and over here, maybe late late 70s, early 80s. Um, but you can see there was a, you know, storage was increased in this reservoir. And so if you look at percent storage, you know, they were down 50% full. Um, you can also see the spike up um, those uh, October rainfalls um, really helped to uh, bring the levels up and so that reservoir is out again there's drought affecting but then um, you know maybe there's some increased use again that that would need additional um, investigation um, two just a couple yeah. two minutes okay so here's the um, some information on you know again you know issues affecting their wetlands on the upstream side of the reservoir and and also concerns about their water supply Lake Travis is not at record low levels, but it's pretty darn close. You can kind of see it. Um, Lake Buchanan as well. Um, also seems to be, this is some work um, Ipong Zhang and I did for a different reason, but but we noticed that like since um, the late 2000s, the uh, flow coming into the um, Lake Travis from the Pertinalis is definitely on a different trajectory, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, we've seen, here's J17, um, not quite the lowest levels, but certainly down in um, historical low levels. This is J27, another indicator well. Um, Kyle has had to uh, um, buy unused Edwards water rights or lease unused Edwards water rights from San Marcos to make sure they had enough water. Um, so they're getting caught. And then here at San Marcos Springs, um, you know, we've seen, uh, depending on the day, uh, because of this stuff in the 80s, um, the lowest flows here since the 1950s. Um, and so that certainly has had consequences. Um, Kamal Springs has certainly seen some lower flows in the past, um, but, you know, the main springs there at Kamal is, has, has gone completely dry. I think maybe it has half a cubic foot per second. Um, going on right now, according to a friend. Barton Springs has also been kind of flirting with uh, um, record low levels to boot. And then Las Morris Springs, these little flat line areas here, you know, it's gone dry quite a bit um, during during this drought. So certainly some consequences there. Um, I just took a look at, uh, you know, the, the Ogallala, this is water level um, um, depth below surf land surface for a well between Amarillo and Pampa. Um, doesn't look like there's been an increase in usage, but there is this kind of constant decrease um, over time. Um, last two slides. Um, what, one thing I've kind of been thinking about and wondering about um, is, uh, is there drought fatigue? It's kind of fascinating to me that the, you know, 20, 2009 to 2015 kind of watching what was happening in Austin with the Highland Lakes and quite a bit of freak out going on. Um, don't detect the same seriousness or freak outedness level, if that's a technical term, you know, this, this go around. Um, and uh, so I kind of wonder like, is there, is there drought fatigue? Maybe even some other places as well. Um, you know, we kind of flirt with these droughts. We don't run out of water, you know, and then the next drought hits and people are like, ah, we're not going to run out of water. We didn't run out of water last time. And so um, just something, I think something to watch out for. I think people are like, you know, give me a call when my water stops flowing. Of course, you don't need to call them when that happens. But, um, but yeah, maybe we're seeing some of that. So some conclusions. Um, the drought and its impacts are, are still ongoing. You know, we're kind of hopeful maybe La Nina conditions will, will pull us out. And we've definitely seen some improvements, but it's still ongoing. You know, look, flows are still pretty low here at San Marcos Springs. We've seen record flows of record lows in reservoirs, um, some pretty low flows um, in uh, San Marcos Springs. I didn't mention San Felipe Springs, but also kind of the lowest flows um, um, on, on record. Um, 
uh, more and more communities are getting surprised by, you know, what the consequences of, of droughts. Uh, more analysis, I think, is needed in whether the issues are growth, drought, politics, or a combination of all of those things. I throw the politics in there because of uh, that. That's a big driver on what's happening with the Rio Grande, and then uh, and then maybe there's some drought fatigue settling. So that uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Robert. We have uh, some time for questions. You can raise your hands in the tab above. Uh, also, you can write your questions in the Q&A tab. Uh, for those that are not are joining this meeting through the through the app, if you are joining through your browser, you will not find the Q&A tab, and you need to raise your hand. Please raise your hands to make your questions. OK, I, I will start, John. Uh, Robert, uh, I was wondering uh, this particular summer, uh, how much can we blame to the heat wave? Uh, because they, they, this, this hot conditions really dry the soil. I don't know if the evaporation might be meaningful. What can you tell us about that between the lack of the, of the precipitation and the heat wave itself. I'm, I'm sorry, I was trying to like unshare my screen and I completely logged myself out. So I literally just joined right now. Um, so, so what's the question again? Yeah, I was wondering uh, how much can we blame to the heat wave itself? OK, there is a lack of precipitation, but how much this kind of heat events dry the soil on and evaporates our water from our reservoirs? Um, so, so I don't know the exact answer. In other words, how much of this is due to, you know, how much of the decrease, say, in, in water resources due to the heat versus due to the lack of precipitation. But, but heat is a major driver. Um, you know, I know there's been some studies done in the past um, on the Highland Lakes um, as part of the LCRA SAWS project where, you know, even with increased rainfall they were expecting lower reservoir um, levels because because the heat dries out the soil you get more evapotranspiration you get less runoff you get less recharge um, so so that that can be um, that can be an issue but in terms of like what's the percentage breakdown i don't you know i don't know and i think it's going to depend and vary depending where you're at in the state I think, <laughs> excuse me, I have a question for you, Robert, Ms. J. Mm -hmm. So you gave us a few peeks into the impacts of the uh, 50s drought of record, and it seemed to be the uh, the trump card, right? Everywhere you, you, you saw it. And I assume that's because that was six years and everything we've been looking at 2011, 2023, obviously has been too short yet to know, but 2011 was relatively short lived. Is, uh, is, is time trumping intensity, right? 2011. 2023 maybe had lower PDSI values, but just not long enough to have the kinds of effects we saw in the 50s. Um, um, yeah, I think that's that's accurate. That it's you know we've been fortunate that we haven't had the persistence in drought that we saw in the 50s. Um, I you know I've seen plots from John Nielsen Gammon, um, and actually I think it shows up in one of the state water plans that where you know, the, the drought from 2011, the 20, statewide drought from 2011, 2015 would have had to go on another two years to rival the length of the 1950s statewide drought. So, um, so we've been fortunate, but, um, you know, looking at, it's probably worthwhile to like, look at the different climatic zones to see kind of, kind of what I showed in that third slide, um, you know, there's, down closer to the Rio Grande, you know, I was a bit surprised to see that, you know, most of the time has been in, you know, vast majority of the time has been in drought. Um, and I've not gone back to see what things look like back in the, the 50s, but, but I thought, thought that was interesting. 
um, and probably warrants a closer look. So I have word that uh, okay. John Nielsen Gammon has uh, can't get in on Teams, but he was remoting in from his home, so he's heading into his office now. He'll be there in about 15 minutes. So I wonder if maybe we uh, flip speakers one more time. The next speaker is ready. Okay. We certainly Thank have, you. Time, but we do have more time for Q and A. So please continue. Thank you, Robert. Uh, well, then uh, our next 